I have Kevin and Ian from Namfong Dialogues here with me. I am so excited to talk to you both about your journey in podcasting. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Welcome to the Vietnamese. I'm your host, Kenneth Nguyen. Being part of a culture of nearly 100 million Vietnamese people in the world today comes with a lot of pain, proud history, and privilege. Join me as I highlight and explore the Vietnamese experience from all over. Thanks for having us. I'm a longtime <laughs> fan, so very happy to be So, Kenneth, that, to, that be, to be totally head. honest, I think a while back when we discovered your podcast and like the lineup of people that you had, we were like, Kevin, one of these days, we're going to go on this podcast. One of we're these <laughs> <laughs> it finally happened. And so when you, you know, reached the crazy out, thing is I reached out to you guys. <laughs> I reached out to you guys. So that, I mean, it's it's flattering, but it's sad at the same time that I had to reach out to you guys. And you guys, well, like, one day you will be on this podcast. You know, I I think one must be chosen. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, you're hilarious. You know, I, I'm not gonna lie. I um, I have this sort of like. uh academic worship mm. I, I i worship people in academia mm. and I, I i've gotten rid of the problem in the last few years uh, like i it, it's steadily going down because i realize you guys are humans too but i i carry that you know that weight from from an uneducated mother mm. uh, she only finished second grade so she constantly put that on me she's like like we're never good enough unless we get that phd mm. and it was constant Every time I mentioned about getting a master's or a PhD, she kept pushing. She's like, you should do it. You should do it. You should do it. And so every time I run into academics on the podcast or in real life, so it's 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 really ironic to hear you guys say one day you'll be on my podcast when I'm like, oh my God, I, I, I'm like chomping at the bit to get you guys on my podcast, worrying about you guys not coming on because the response uh, on Instagram DM with you guys have been like, you know, I think one person's waiting for the other to respond. And I'm like, are these guys coming on or not? <laughs> you know, so thank you both for coming on. Also, the different time zones, that's like an added factor. Yeah, we are in three yes, different time yes, zones all... right now. Yes, that's right. Um, in you're in Saigon. And then Kevin, you're in Amsterdam. I'm in Amsterdam. That's amazing. Yeah. But we will definitely get into that. Um, I think we should start where um, I think, can we talk a little bit about who each of you are? And then we'll get into sort of the journey of the podcast. And Ian, we'll, we'll, we'll probably start with you. Okay. Sounds good. So hi, everyone. My name is Ian. I am California raised, born in Vietnam. And I moved to California quite young and very much like you and your parents really honing in the education that to me was the ticket out of anywhere or to go anywhere is to get educated. So um, that's why I ended up getting a PhD because even though I never knew what I would get my PhD in, I knew that I would get a PhD <laughs> or like I would at least try. Um, a little one did I know that it actually took a long time. That's really quite hard. But um, I did my research and my PhD in uh, a French department. So I worked on French literature. And it was really from there that I started getting interested back in Vietnam. Um, I was interested in questions about expression. Why would the Vietnamese choose French to write their literature? I was also a literary scholar. So um, that question is really the question that channels or drives most of my research still today. But I, you know, and, and it's like asking um, anyone today, why would you choose a language that's not your mother tongue to write your poetry or write your literature? And so I currently teach at Fulbright University in Vietnam. I've been in this position for three years. This is coming up my third. And I've done a number of different postdocs and academic positions, but I found myself back here in Vietnam and that's been really rewarding so far. Yeah. I have a, I have a lot of questions about Fulbright, but we'll get to that sure. after we talk about, uh, yeah. All right, my turn. So hi everyone, my name is Kevin Pham. And uh, since we're talking about education and PhDs, I actually didn't know what a PhD was until I was a senior year, uh, in my senior year of college. I um, 
I, I grew up, I was born and raised in San Jose, California. And when I went to college, I thought I was going to be a tattoo artist. And so I was very serious about that. I drew a lot. Nice. I had a portfolio. I was going around to different tattoo shops asking if I could be an apprentice. <laughs> um, but at the time, I was getting interested in in um, political theory, which is basically just deep philosophical questions about how we should organize our society, what is a good life, who should have power. And I went on a trip to the Middle East, which changed my life overnight. And when I came back, I was no longer interested in tattoos. I wanted to study the world. I suddenly started reading a lot. And there was a professor who I really admired, and I basically just wanted to be him. And I I, I was so uh, impacted by him. And so I eventually went down that academic path. And I am now a, a professor or assistant professor of political theory at the University of Amsterdam. And before that, I was an assistant professor of political science at Gettysburg College, a small liberal arts college. Um, yeah. So I, I, I want to apologize to the audience. I think we're going to shut this podcast down right now. Each of you need your own episode. I'm making a mistake here. Oh my God. My brain is like turning like a million miles an hour. And I'm so sorry that we have to look, we're going to get each of you on your own, uh, a podcast, but today we're just going to try to like push through and balance this. You know, I, I find that to have both of you such, you know, such, a uh, powerful academics uh, you deserve each deserve your your own um, episode and we will get to that but today we'll we'll go through the nam fong dialogues and you know um yeah i have so many questions about fulbright and your your uh you know fuk tran uh, from saigon he wrote uh, he wrote saigon he's also a tattoo artist and you know classic uh so there's there's parallels there uh with with your life and i wonder how much you know about his uh journey and and, and all of that and you know why did you go to the middle east and i went to the middle east and i have so many questions about why you why it changed you all right so <laughs> there goes my add uh, <laughs> my brain going in like a thousand directions okay so now that we know that about both of you where and how did you both meet I mean, I know the answer to that because I've already listened to that episode <laughs> that you guys put out, but the audience doesn't know. I already know that. And that's why I'm going to ask you more questions about how you met and all that. Yeah, Kevin. I, I think it's fair for me to go first because I think I I saw Ian before Ian oh. saw me. And that's because <laughs> I was, let me explain. Tell us how you really feel, Kevin. I was, I was in the audience when Ian was giving a paper presentation at Sciences Po in Paris, this was the summer of 2017, and it, it was a crowded audience. You know, I was sitting in the back, and what struck me was that so Ian was delivering this presentation in perfect, fluid French. I thought she was French, and and uh, at that point I could understand French, so I could follow it. And she was talking about this Vietnamese thinker Nguyen Man Tu and saying how he loved Michel de Montaigne. And that made me really excited because Montaigne is my favorite philosopher of all time. So then after that, I went right up to her and I was like, oh my gosh, I loved your presentation. And so from there we became friends. And, and that- The rest of the story. <laughs> and how long, how long ago was that? So that's 20... 2017. 16. 17? 17. Okay. 17. So that's about seven years ago. And, and and in how did your French get so good? Um, okay, I think Kevin's memory did a little like flip there because I was reading quotes in French, but I did not deliver this this <laughs> paper in 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 French. At least I don't think don't think so. But I had taken French in high school, and then also, I mean, that was my PhD. So if I didn't know how to speak French, that would be very questionable. I also spent a lot of time in France. Um, in, in Paris and in Bordeaux. Bordeaux. So I've had opportunities to improve my French. <laughs> Got it. Right. And, and at that time, so Ian had been in France for about a year, right? Yeah. And then I was just entering. So we were like tag teaming Paris and I was there for a year. And so uh, 
we started keeping in touch. Then right after that, Ian organized this panel in Copenhagen. And then uh, ever since then, we've just been meeting each other at conferences. And where did the idea of having a podcast come from? Well, that was much later. <laughs> um, the, what was nice about meeting Kevin was he was very easy to get along with. I remember that same day, we I was like, oh, well, I need to go buy some oils for my mom. And he was like, okay, I'll come. And so he went with me to get these like these essential oils for my mom. And no, no, it was Algerian oils. And then um, like being able to just talk about anything, uh, that was like the first step to building our friendship. And then we realized we had very similar research interests. We were interested in intellectuals who worked or who wrote during the early 20th century. And this is kind of where the beginnings of our podcast emerged because the, the, well, there's, there's two parts So the part. The first part is just having enough conversations where we're like, you know what, these conversations are really good. Like we should write a paper or we should do something together. And then one day it was just like, what if we had a podcast? And so that was kind of the beginning seminations. Do you want to tell more of the story, Kevin? <laughs> yeah, I mean, for me, I grew up in San Jose, like I said, but I actually did not have many Vietnamese American friends. And so Ian was kind of the first person I met who was from California, who was interested in intellectual philosophical things. I came from a Catholic family background, you know, doing a PhD. So for the first time, I felt like I could explore what it meant to be Vietnamese American and also in this intellectual space. And so uh, it was really helpful to have someone to talk with, you know, to get feedback from. That's how we develop as thinkers. We we can't think alone. We need other people. And so um, I think our podcast idea came about, especially when we were at a retreat in Seattle with other Vietnam scholars. So there were scholars of Vietnam and actually Kenneth, you know, uh, Duong Vu, he mm -hmm. invited uh, us. Uh, well, you know, he helped to organize it. And there we we pitched this idea to those people and and Duong also, and they were like, yeah, go for it. And Duong Vu was very generous. He helped, you know, give us some financial assistance, for example, like for the music and... Yeah, so so it was really the point is that it, we needed that community. Wait, hold up! It. Did you guys go to that yeah. last year in Oregon? No, 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 no. You, no, I, no I, not I, the I, one you were at. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you guys went to the the one before the earlier yeah. one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah. So so that's how it got. Yeah, started. and got it. And then the name the name is a tribute to the scholar that we both study at some point. So I wrote an article on someone named Pham Quang and Kevin wrote a whole book chapter on someone named Pham Quang. And so this individual, this intellectual, started this journal called Nam Phong Tak Ji or the Southern Wind Review. And it really tried to capture an ethos that was the spirit of intellectual exchange. There were um, research articles written in different languages, Mandarin, Vietnamese, and French. There were glossaries so that people can learn new vocabulary words. There were um, administrative reports, but also works of fiction, works of literature. And um, in that spirit, in the ethos of the, of the Southern Wind, that was that journal we decided to call our, our podcast now, Dialogues. And, and I want to say a little bit more about that ethos because Sat Quinn, in that journal, he's basically trying to marry Vietnamese culture and French culture. And it seemed like since Ian and I met in France and we are interested mm. in French philosophers and we have this Vietnamese background, we kind of want to do the same sort of, you know, maybe not Vietnam and France, but also kind of East, West, that kind of, how did these cultures talk to each other. That's what we're interested in. You know, I, I've had uh, a problem with 
being colonized uh, on a very basic level, uh, French coming into Vietnam. And I think that growing up, that was like something that weighed heavily on me. And I pushed back on the Vietnamese Catholic culture and really questioned um, the French influence and and really French uh, aesthetics too uh, prevailing in my family. Mm. I hated it. And uh, the older I've gotten though, the more I'm beginning to sort of just be open to the idea that organically this has ha has happened and that now meeting like now sitting with both of you seeing the appreciation um of somebody who is trying to marry the, the this idea of french and vietnamese culture in a journal um do you both have feelings that 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 do you guys share the feelings that i have or have had with uh, either your American side or your this French this idea of French influence in our Vietnamese culture. Do you want to take that? I one? can start. I can start. I mean, I think, I think my feelings toward any kind of Western influence is complex because, on the one hand, I mean, I am Vietnamese, but I grew up mainly in the West, um, and then seeing here how much you know the West has influenced Vietnam. I guess this, this speaks specifically in the context of French and Vietnam. Like, how do how do I feel in relation to the French influences that exist in Vietnam? Um, quite ambivalent because, on the one hand, I think it helps Vietnam like have multiple multiple solutions to one problem, different ways of looking at one problem. Let's say, but the reason why it's ambivalent is a lot of those problems were also created by the French. <laughs> So, or, or like the conveniences that were brought by the French were mainly to benefit the French. So I think if you, t if you look at just like the everyday colonial life um, and maybe like the technologies that were brought, like, was it all good? No. And was it all bad? No. I think there are different ways to look at the issue that can be a little bit more complex. And I, I can and I totally sympathize with someone who feels residue of that animosity or that just anger toward being colonized and i think that'll be that would take some time like that's never going to go away i hope you never actually like suppress that anger because if you channel that anger towards something more productive then you can have something else you know i think a lot of us work with our post colonial contexts in different ways but for me rather than just feeling angry, then maybe it's actually looking into that specific moment where Vietnam and France came into contact and then it became something like my research. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I completely realize that it's a, you know, it's a, um, a, a juvenile uh, way of thinking when you sort of, what, what kind of, right? You just take all the chopsticks and go, this is the bundle, they're all bad, right? So we don't, I don't do that because just years of having conversation with people like you guys, have opened up my eyes to um, not, you know, feel one way or the other, but just question mm -hmm. everything. And um, hearing what you're saying is is a very beautiful thing. You know, there's nuances in 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 politics. There's nuance in culture, in food, and music. There's everything that uh, that exists. You know, there's extremes, and I think we just need to question everything instead of going. You know, I love that beautiful nose. That are you French? Part French? Mm -hmm. That's what went on in my family for many, many yeah, decades. And, and I, I, you know, I mean, I, but I, I think what you're feeling is, is not, it's not like the hatred toward the French, but it's that privileging of those French traits that diminish the Vietnamese, you know, the, the Vietnamese qualities, like those qualities are also great in different ways, but, but yes, Absolutely. I totally get it. <laughs> you, you know, um, this is making me realize that Kenneth, I actually, I'm listening to you and I realized like, I did not grow up with that. I did not grow up. I mean, I grew up in a Vietnamese Amer American family, but I never was really exposed to any kind of French anything, except maybe my mom would watch Paris by night, but that's literally it. But um, now you're making me realize though, that recently I was talking with my dad and he said, Oh, Kevin, all the Vietnamese here in San Jose, all my friends, they all love the French. They're like, ooh. And I was like, really? I've never, never, I didn't know that until like, like a few months ago. That's so that's right. news to me. Uh, when I was growing up, I almost felt more like 
why am I so colonized by China? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because because I would go every month to do gong, you know, with a family altar, incense sticks. When I was a teenager, I was like, where does this tradition come from? It's all Confucian. Lunar New Year, that's Chinese. I mean, this is all like, so I felt more like, why am I, why am I Chinese? Or what is the difference between the Vietnamese and the Chinese if we're doing the same thing? Mm -hmm. That's a whole nother podcast. Yes. <laughs> Chinese and Vietnamese culture. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, going back to the French, uh, yes, Vietnamese people of the, the first generation diaspora love the fact that they were French educated. Like the elites love the fact that, you know, I went to a French high school. It's it's something that it's, they wear with a badge, badge of honor. And for me, that was uh, a problem growing up. It became a problem growing up because even the most um, the uneducated, uh, like on my mother's side, were, oh, we have French bloodlines. We're all like six foot tall. And we're, you know, we have the nose. You know, my brother and my, my mom's side of the family, these, the beautiful French noses. And then I was like, all right, cool. So a few years ago, we did a 20 and me test. My brother and I came back 90. I mean, it was like, it was insane. It was, we, my brother and I actually were like 25, 30% Chinese because of my dad's side. And then, there was no European blood at, at, at whatsoever. And we showed it to our family. And like, there's no, and then they're like, no, we don't believe in that stuff. That's like technology that, and we're like, okay, all right. So this is how deep this stuff runs. Yeah. But it also, my dad was a Francophile and he read Victor Hugo. He, you know, really believed in uh, French literature as sort of like, um, you know, enlightenment and all of these movements that Vietnam doesn't have or didn't have for him growing up. So that appreciation for him being French educated. And then my mom's side with the aesthetics really made me turn, you know, it was just, it was a turn off. And so I am finding my way back into conversation, nuanced conversation with, with people wow. who know better. That's interesting. Maybe it's relevant here to say that my wife is French. <laughs> and the so ultimate I've Francophile. Really, <laughs> you know, right? Like I, I've been, I mean, we did long distance for seven years, but I would spend every summer for like three months in France and getting to know the family. But then I realized that, yeah, I've been hanging out with a lot of French people, like the professor that I had mentioned earlier. His He's American, but his wife is French and they only speak French at home and I lived with them. And yeah, I've been exposed to a lot of Frenchness, but it really wasn't until after college. Like I just, there was nothing French in my life before then. So, so it's really interesting to hear this from you. Yeah, it was everywhere. I had a restaurant in 1997 and all I would do is play French music uh, at the campus at UCLA, the Westwood Village. And we had like a little patio and we just blare French music. That was like my, oh, we're Vietnamese. We're going to play French music of the 40s, the Belle Epoque with uh, Edith Piaf mm -hmm. and, you know, Charles, I forget his last name. But all that kind of mu music of, the, of those years is the, the music that brought sort of like this ambiance to like this patio dining, you know, experience at, at UCLA. And, and I, I thought that was the right thing, mm -hmm. but turns out that, um, yeah, it's questionable. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's all, a, when I look back, it's, it's very questionable. Yeah. But I think that is a trend. Like there is a certain nostalgia for, Sure. For that, I don't know if it's nostalgia for the colonial era. I don't know if it's this nostalgia for that cultural c c contact that happened so freely or freely in a different way um, that we don't have here in the same way, in the same sense. And, you know, it's always when, it, when it's in the past and you're no longer feeling the hurt from the past and it's easy to be nostalgic about it. But I think nostalgia is one aspect and that's why, you know, people are very, I think there are people are, they're more Francophile than I, I would think they would be considering it's a post-colonial territory, you know? Um, and then the other aspect is the, for, for the people who read Victor Hugo or the literature, the French literature, I think, I think they were also looking for, for novelty, for something new. So like new forms and new things that didn't, exist in vietnam and i i you know i think that's a very rational thing to pursue to pursue novelty 
You know, when, when we, my brother and I first went back to Vietnam 25 years ago and we started going back quite a bit, we had a factory with my parents and we were running this thing. And then we would, I think in the first few years we were chest puffed up high. We're Americans. And then after you're there for about two, three years, you start to realize, you know, my brother moved back to Vietnam. He was born in Vietnam, moved back. And then we start to realize that this is not the way to behave. The, you mm -hmm. know, this, you don't, could you start to see other uh, Viet, Viet Qs coming back to Vietnam, you know, with the same sort of like flag waving kind of feel, right? And you're like, well, that, that's not the way to, that, this is not the way to integrate. And then I started to kind of like project out like 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now when, um, you know, Viet, Viet, Viet Qs from the US is coming back to Vietnam, are they going to have that same weird Francophile uh, nostalgia about America when they're resettling, like if we ever lost the United States to to mm. to China and and all of these Vietnamese to return back to to the homeland, are we going to one day look back and go, America? We are, mm. you know, I think that's a sickness, a national nationalistic sickness to carry this nostalgia back to to really to the homeland to Vietnam because. You know, we're, we're blinded by this identity that we are Americans sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I think going back to Vietnam, um, we got to shed that and we got to be very aware that Vietnam has a very special identity um, with without these American and French <laughs> influences. You know, you know, this is reminding me because right after college, I decided to move to Vietnam and live there for eight months. I was in Nha Trang. I was teaching English. And right before I left, my dad told me, he said, look, Kevin, sometimes when Viet Gu, especially American Viet Gu, when they go to Vietnam, they think they're so badass that, yeah. they're, and they're just being mean. Don't be one of those. I don't think you will. But one thing you should do is for every, for every word you speak, listen to five, wow. basically listen much more than you speak. And I thought that was really good advice because... I would show up, I would ask questions and let people talk. And I would ask them, what do you think of Viet Gyu? And some of them did tell me like, yo, we have some issues with them, but you know, you're funny. So, it, you know, just be there and be curious and just listen. Ian, were you going to say something? No, but I do think that when you travel, when you go anywhere, and obviously you were bringing yourself, but that's kind of all you need. You don't need to bring any extra like identities or armors Absolutely. or anything like that. Um, you're like the, the whole point of travel is to be in that in-between space where you can do anything and be anyone. And so like, it would be such a waste to me. It's such a waste to like, carry that American identity with you everywhere and like tout it as if <laughs> like, I feel like there's so many other things that you can potentially experiment with. Like, why not? You know? Right. The thing though, it's like, um, the, the beauty of this, I guess, is like, even if you don't say anything about your Americanness, they are going to see you and they're going to be like, Oh, you're the American guy. And whether you like it or not, you're representing America to them. And so but, but that's, that's the best way to re represent. But that's what I mean. You already carry that regardless. Yeah. So you don't need to tout it about, right. you know? Yeah. Exactly. yeah. yeah. I, I would add the only thing you need to bring to any country is curiosity. Mm -hmm. That's what you need to bring. You need to bring loads of curiosity and yeah. show people how curious you are yeah. about their culture. You scratch, and other than that, leave everything. You scratch Kevin's itch right again. there. <laughs> That's something Kevin would say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that word. Yeah, it's true. I, I and I and I think that's why we are all in the podcasting space because it allows us to really, uh, really satisfy this curiosity, mm -hmm. right? Because I, I think th being in the podcast space, um, I, like I, I never get satisfied with enough scratching or this. It, 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 I, I'm not ever satiated. Mm -hmm. it, it's never, it, it never goes away because I'm just so dying for information constantly. And, and why I want to listen to how people feel and think about um, the Vietnamese identity, the Vietnamese culture. And with that being said, how do you um, both 
from two different countries, two different time zones, come together and say, hey, we're going to create a podcast. And so how did that like initial in the beginning start out? Mm. I'm trying to think of like those early days of brainstorming. So we definitely happened during COVID. And COVID during, it's that special time where, I mean, again, we look at it now, a special. <laughs> um, it was special. Where everything was kind of up in the air. And so anything was possible. And uh, at least for me, I, I that was my optimistic view of things. Like you know, nothing is confirmed now. So now everything is possible. And we were like, yeah, why don't we just try this podcast? And so I think we had brainstormed of things we would want to talk about. Um, but it came out that we would want to do some book reviews or have conversations about uh, ideas that were interesting to us. But I, I'm remembering that our first episode was maybe just to get to know each other. And then the second episode was on Theros. It was on this idea that Kevin had pitched about being about traveling. And that's like your duty is to go out in the world, explore it, and then bring it back and share with your community. And that's essentially that captures the essence of what we want to do in this podcast is we want to go out in the world. Maybe that's do research talk to other people, read their books, and then bring it back to share with our community. And bring it back in a, in a way where we translate it either literally from different languages or conceptually, like say it in a way that our community can, you know, understand. So um, this podcast also was sort of an excuse for us to read the books we wanted to read but you know and and so we could read it together for example our third episode was martina Nguyen's book mm -hmm. right? yeah martina Nguyen. yeah and so um so that episode on hybridity in 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 vietnam it, so the podcast was also for me at least kind of a strategic sort of because in this academic business you know as a professor you have to publish and so this podcast is an excuse to do research and learn new things and get ideas for articles. So I, I thought it was good for my intellectual journey. And I assume same goes for you. Mm, yeah. I mean, I think yeah. like you had said earlier, you can't really have conversations by yourself. I mean, you can, and I have, I do. I, they just only get to a certain point <laughs> when you have someone yeah, else, it's True. they, they challenge you and, then you, start, you need resistance. Mm -hmm, and then, exactly. You need resistance to grow stronger and you need to be pushed in different angles or areas that you didn't think you would go. And I think that's important to explore that new territory. But, you know, I think logistically, though, what your question was getting at, we weren't in two different countries when we started. We were in the U.S. and we were on the same time zone. And then slowly... I came, I went to Vietnam and then Kevin went to Amsterdam. So we just got further and further away from each other. But this is the ultimate test, I guess, is being able to still find a time once a month, record our episode and, and like touch base on like what, what is it we want to communicate with our community. And, and also I should mention there was a sense of duty as well. I mean, we both were lucky to have these opportunities and, academia. And when I was younger, when I was in college trying to learn about Vietnam, all I had, honestly, were long, detailed history books that were kind of boring to read, honestly, and kind of wish I had a podcast, you know. That, so we wanted to do it for the young, for the young folks. Yeah. And, and it's, it's been working, you know, like we get emails from strangers, from, from young people who say I was Late one night, I wanted to learn about Vietnam. I Googled around and found your podcast, and I loved it. And the other day, I went to a Vietnamese restaurant here in Amsterdam. And then it turns out that the the, the waitress loves our podcast. Wow. <laughs> like, this is a, you know, it, it's so amazing. You know, I want to um, really encourage you both never to stop. Um, and I'll tell you why I feel that way. I, I know it gets hard. I I I live it and I and I guess I'm telling myself this too. But I know it got it's got to be doubly hard with two people. 
right? Because you, you're like depending on each other and you know, who's doing more of the workload. There could be like built up feelings about resentment, like who's doing, there could be a million things going on. Right. Um, but I just encourage you to both to kind of go as long as you possibly can. And here's why I've listened to your podcast. You guys go so deep with the topics. I, uh, have learned so much, um, with, the episodes that I've listened to, like the sympathizer one that I that I listened to, I never thought about empathize and sympathize. And in in Vietnamese and in um, those two words in Vietnamese, when you guys drill down on those topics, they're so deep and profound. They make the listener really think about um, how special um, having this dual sort of living in two worlds are. And I really appreciate it. I hope it never stops. And I'm, I, you know, I, I, I just stumbled on your podcast recently, and I'm, I'm such a big fan. And I've listened <laughs> to about four or five now, and uh, I, I'm going to go through all of them. And I want to hear more, and I want to learn more. And I think that um, there is niches all over our community that are not being filled. And I think the academic podcast. Uh, you two are probably at the leading edge of of this, and you know Tracy uh, has the Vietnamese mm-hmm. book people, and she's doing that. Uh, I'm just doing everything, uh, wh- wh- whoever I can touch, whoever I can reach out to, because I'm. But then that academic niche is so uh, powerful because uh, the critical thinking that you two bring to the table is um, phenomenal, phenomenal work. Thank you, thank you. It does lot. mean a lot, yeah. and really. I I think you're when you're able to tell me that it means that we've done something right that we c- communicated properly <laughs> i had forgotten that we talked oh, about yeah. empathize and sympathize actually um but it, you're absolutely right about dwelling in the in-between space and like without the proper guidance or without the proper i guess community it's it's really easy just kind of fall in the cracks and for me and for kevin we, we kind of imagine our our targeted, you know, our ideal audience. It's like someone who is 18 years old, 20 years old, who's kind of figuring out who they are and maybe they want to go in academia or maybe they just want to learn more about Vietnam. But having something that speaks their language, it is technical sometimes. We do have these kind of academic moments, but for the most part, if there's anything that can kind of reach them, I think that's the... the makes me feel so very satisfied yeah um can you both talk about how you um pick a topic and then break a topics uh mm-hmm. down and then sort of how you the process of putting together a podcast episode maybe we should just simply start with the, the very last one so the last episode we did was about our Wait, fathers we no, it's okay. Uh, you can, no, you can share it. It's okay. <laughs> By the time this comes out, that one will come out. out. Yeah, right. it out. Right, right. Oh, okay, okay. Spoiler alert. I won't spoil it too much, but basically, um, our last episode was about our fathers, uh, namely, our how our relationship with our fathers have changed over time and, and what that meant for us as Vietnamese Americans who were studying Vietnam. And so we came up with that podcast because, um, well, partly because of me, I was talking to my mother-in-law. She's, she's French. Her, uh, she listens to our podcast. You know, her English is, 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 is there, it's good. I mean, she can understand, you know? And so I asked her, um, what should we do? And she said, I want to hear more about your parents. So, the episode we had before that was about our mothers and we told the stories of our mothers. And so it seemed to make sense. We should do it about our fathers. And so do you want to add to that? Yeah. I mean, I think the way that we organize and plan for our podcast is very, it's very much like writing an article. (laughs) So, or like writing some kind of academic work. We always ask ourselves, what are the guiding questions? And it's like, like an article, like a book, what are my research questions? And then um, to bring things closer down to earth, we always close with what is it that we want others to take away from this 
And I think those kinds, those two operating things, having a guiding questions and then always asking yourself, well, what is it that I want my audience to take away from this? That not only makes you a good communicator, it makes you a good teacher. It, it is, I don't know, it, it seems so simple, but it's actually quite hard for a lot of people. So those are, I think every episode has some kind of form of that form of that. If it's a book that we're reviewing, for example, we'll talk about, you know, the conditions around the book, what each of us thought, like how we did with the sympathizer. Um, but we'll generally, because there's so many things to talk about and we're just the two of us and we have a limited hour, usually it's um, what are like two points? Yeah, yeah less is more. And, and we have a we have a Google Doc that we mm -hmm. throw ideas on, and then we structure it. So there is some structure that we want to follow. But I agree with Yen; it's got to be coherent and unified somehow, motivated by the question. But there's a lot of subjects. I I can't imagine landing on, you know, and picking uh, a subject, oh, yeah. or maybe having like so many, and then going, well, where do we? How do we pick this out? Uh, so as Kevin mentioned, like we we get a, a lot of our ideas from our listeners, listeners who pitch ideas. And we, we love that. We want to do episodes that you want to hear. So um, we've had other we have we've had people pitch like uh, films like, could you do a review of this? Like the sympathizer, a review of the show, the adaptation that was something that was pitched to us. Um, even the Ken Burns documentary. I can't remember if we had someone had pitched this, but but regardless, someone had asked me, "Will you do a review of the Ken Burns documentary?" And that was already in the works. So, um, have you guys done that one did. yet? It's one of the earlier ones. Yeah. Okay, yes. I got to check that one out. <laughs> I'm dying to hear what you guys think of that. And, and another one was um, Ian and I. We presented at this conference at Fulbright University, of Vietnam about the Dongqing Yetuk, the Tonkin Free School, at school from 1907 and why it was so significant. It was one of the first schools to expose Vietnamese students to ideas from the West. And so we did a series on that, right? We had two episodes on that. And so we do series as well. We had like a freedom series, like the meaning of freedom according to communists and according to anti-communists and you know the different ways to understand freedom so we all right serious. so now i do want to get into fulbright um recently um my episode with g from fulbright the president fulbright i don't know why recently it's gotten attacked they don't attack me they attacked her mm -hmm. on my on my on that episode that i did with her and i I've, I've, been, I've asked a few people and, and I don't get the real answers. So I'm reading the comments and, and they're all in Vietnamese. Uh, I read, I'm fluent in Vietnamese and I'm reading it and I don't understand why it just happened because that, that episode was like two years ago maybe. And all of a sudden there's a snowball. Mm -hmm. um, and I think about Fulbright and I think about academic freedom and I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to bring this up with you today and talk to you about what does true academic freedom in Vietnam look like at Fulbright today in Vietnam, how does the people of Vietnam, uh, the government, the people, I, 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 sometimes you can separate it, sometimes you can't, because I'm like, wait, these netizens are, are attacking this idea of uh, this Western educated president, uh, President Thuy, which went to Wharton. Mm -hmm. And now I'm trying to figure out how do people in Vietnam really feel about of an education at Fulbright because of now what I've read in the last few months, um, this attack on President, former President Tui. So there's a lot of information to unpack there. Um, uh, so, huh, <laughs> where do I start? I think I'll just kind of start with some of the facts that have been cleared out recently in the past month or two, um, which is that we had a disinformation campaign that was launched against Fulbright. And this circulated a number of slander, a number of information that was not true. Things like um, it's an institution that is cultivating a color revolution. And that's not even Western language. That's the language that is used against you know, what's happening in Bangladesh. Um, 
th that uh, the U.S. that the, this was a U.S. institution that we were, you know, kind of cultivating American sympathizers, um, a number of things. But it was it was very clear that it was targeted because right before our enrollments in the new school year. So um, what what happened was at first it was just social media and there was a mistake where some of this messaging appeared on a government platform, a governmental platform. It was quickly taken down, but by the time it had taken down, it already circulated. Yeah. So um, this means that now there's a lot of information that has been out that is not true about Fulbright because from the very beginning, the U.S. and Vietnam were in this together. It was a bilateral collaboration between the two totally. nations. Yeah. And the Vietnamese government and its leadership up until then have always been very supportive of Fulbright and its mission. Totally on board. Yes. Yeah. Um, so now we've, we're kind of having to deal with some of the repercussions of, of that disinformation campaign. And um, unfortunately, you know, a lot of students are very concerned. Their parents are very concerned. Um, and kind of you, you should know that my aunt who lives in San Jose, she sent me a screenshot of my face <laughs> with the tagline, you're starting a revolution. Where is my national flag? Like, so this, wow. this was a, my, it was a, it was a video that I was in for commencement and things were taken out of context, things were taken out of context. saying that, oh, we didn't fly the Vietnamese national flag. Like, oh, we're not patriotic. And and so she sent me this this screenshot. And she was like, "You know, is everything okay?" And I was like, "It's fine. It's just, you know, I this is not something that we have control over." And essentially, I think that's really that captures like how I feel too about this whole thing is that we could not have prevented this, you know, and. I think to a certain extent, Fulbright could have anticipated this because when an institution like Fulbright comes into a place like Vietnam, there's bound to be resistance and there's bound to be people who disagree with our messaging. We just didn't know to what extent and how far it would go. This is really kind of beyond what we were, what we were expecting. And so now we have to deal with the consequences, but... Um, that's just kind of answering the first question, the first bits of your of of what you brought up. You yeah, also it, asked. this was like out of yeah, nowhere, yeah. out of nowhere, and it's like bombing my 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 YouTube channel. I'm like, this is nuts that this is happening. Yeah, and so she's she's not the yeah, only so one, I'm, I'm, right? Because there's also um, there's other people who have spoken up on our behalf who have also been attacked, like diplomats who have spoken up on our behalf, who have been attacked and. Uh, we were just kind of we were in encouraged to just lay low, let it pass, and not engage because that's really th the most that you can do. If you once you engage, you give just give more data points, and like anything that you do could be twisted or turned, yeah. you know. Because this was our commencement, and we did things very officially. We sang the national anthem, you know. There was there was really nothing else we could have done. So, but on the question of academic freedom, yeah, I'm. I'm yeah, I think Kevin can also speak to this because you were you were at the conference about the liberal arts education, and we had a conference at Fulbright about tracing the origins of the liberal arts education model that is Fulbright to an earlier model, which is the 1907 Tonkin Free School, and saying that you know, liberal arts kind of has already been in the works for over a century. Um, Fulbright is definitely more free than. A lot of other institutions in terms of what students can ask, how students can comport themselves, the way that students relate to professors. Um, and sometimes, you know, students do push that boundary where I'm like, eh, you're still my student. Um, you know, you don't get to challenge everything that I say, especially when, and, not, not, and I'm not just saying that, but like, especially when I'm very intentional about what I teach. So you can't just challenge for the sake of challenging. Um, so sometimes students do that, but most of the time, 
it's just really appreciate getting to think in new ways and ask really hard questions and, and dig into their curiosity. And I think Kevin has experienced that when he's met some of our students too. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll just say that I was having dinner with some, some students from Fulbright and they were just telling me that they used to hate the subject of history. But then they went to Fulbright, and for the first time, a professor showed them that history is asking questions and, you know, getting a complicated story rather than just being told, you know, uh, taught in a dry way, re remembering facts and things like that. And I just have to say, like, they are some of the most brilliant students I've ever seen. I mean, I was just blown away when I, um, I've been there a few times, and so... It was pretty heartbreaking to hear all this negative stuff. I mean, people just have no idea. I mean, they, they are very proud Vietnamese, you know, very smart. Um, so, yeah, it's just a It shame. makes me wonder, you know, especially because I, I work at Fulbright and I've been here for a while, but to ask, is Vietnam ready for a place like Fulbright? And I, I've asked this. Yeah, I think mark that off. I've asked this in a different context, and some people say it will never be, which is really interesting to me. I still haven't really figured out what that means, and I think. Oh my God! I Kevin and I are both raising our hand. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot to say about this, but Kevin, go ahead first, and I'm going to give I, my two I, cents. I just want to say that, like you know, in in uh, Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City, the book stream, mm -hmm. right? Every time I go back to Vietnam and I try to go at least like, you know, often, uh, but I have seen new books come out in Vietnamese, translations of stuff I would have never expected. Recently, I saw uh, Milton Friedman's Capitalism and Freedom. I saw John Stuart Mill, his essays on liberty and free speech translated to Vietnamese. And a few years ago, I think there was... Um, either a party member or somebody who got in trouble for translating that book. So there's like no doubt a kind of relaxing here. So it seems like, yeah, it's ready for Fulbright. At least that's what it seemed like. You, you know, I uh, bring this up in the my podcast constantly, which is, you know, is the Vietnamese government communist or is the Vietnamese government really Confucian driven? And what I mean by that is, it's a very top-down society. And you, even when you think about uh, American democracy, it's like, all right, well, it's just you, me, them. It's not back to go kao kong, right? There's no hierarchy in that American democracy. Uh oh, is that? <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm really stretching the generalization of this idea of it being a very hierarchical world in, in Vietnam. So... You know, this idea of like, all right, well, let's use communism as this hierarchical kind of like, this is the way we we do it in Vietnam. And so when I think about the government, I'm like, ah, communist is just a, it's a cool name, but it's a cool brand. But really what's at the engine driving the control is this idea of back, go, yeah. You know, it's <laughs> all of this hierarchical language that's built into the culture. All right, Kevin, let it rip. All right. I mean, you're asking the yeah. political theorists and political scientists here. So I realize I think this is a good moment for me to shamelessly plug something I'm very proud of. Uh, for the last eight years, I've been working on a book about Vietnamese political thought during the colonial period, and it came out two days ago. So, yeah. yay. <laughs> And it's titled The Architects of Dignity, Vietnamese Visions of Decolonization. And it looks at the political thought of six influential thinkers. I'm Wait, hold up, hold, hold up, hold up. You just posted something on Viet Soto Trades or something That's like it. that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my was God. I was like, I, I swear to God, I was going to, I didn't know it was you. I was going to literally message. I'm like, hey, would you come on the podcast? <laughs> Yes, I will. The answer is yes. The answer is yes. And here you, I did not put one and one together. Oh my God, I'm such a, I am no, 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 no. dumbass. Oh my God. No, yes, no, no. I've been seeing this and I'm like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to message this Kevin guy. Okay, great. This is, oh my God, the universe sports. We're, 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 we're already right. talking. Um, but I, I just want to say, because I want to get to your point about Confucianism and, and um, communism. But the book looks at 
uh, Fan Boy Cho, Fan Chu Chen, Win Anin, Fan Quen, Ho Chi Minh, and Win Man Du. My chapter on Ho Chi Minh is about exactly what you're saying, Kenneth. And my response would be that for Ho Chi Minh, he saw communism as being perfectly compatible with Confucianism. In fact, Marxism and Confucianism were essentially the same thing. Here's what I mean by that. Uh, oh my God, my suspicions all these years are finally being yeah, yeah, yeah. approved here. Yeah, yeah. I just always and, have this strange suspicion that the two are the same. Yeah, yeah. And and it's not just Ho Chi Minh saying this. There's another very uh, well-known um, Vietnamese historian. His name's Nguyen Kak Vien. And he says the same thing. A lot have said the same thing, which is basically this. So um, the version of communism that the Vietnamese communist revolutionaries adopted was arguably Leninism. So Leninism requires a vanguard. So a, a professional, intelligent, wise class of virtuous, moral leaders who will guide the masses towards their vision of socialism. And that's the key word, wise leaders, right? So that's what Lenin was all about. When Lenin was like, if you leave the working class or the peasants alone, they're never going to do a revolution. You need wise people to go there, explain to them uh, why they're being oppressed, and then you need to guide them. And Ho Chi Minh basically was like, this is Confucianism. Confucianism uh, uh, is all about moral leadership, getting their legitimacy uh, from from uh, being good to the people and people like, you know, fulfilling their duty to the people, basically. So good leaders need to ensure that people are educated, fed, and that people need to love the leaders. So it's exactly what you're talking about, the uncle and the children. You know, for Confucian society is just simply a big family. It's very different from the West. In the West, society is a contract between individuals. But in Confucianism, we're not just individuals. We each have roles in a family, a set of corresponding duties, right? And that's what the Vietnamese imagine their whole society and government should be. Government's the parents and and the children are, you know, the people are the children. I mean, they call Uncle Ho uncle. That means they accept that they're the children. You know why I've always had this weird, strange suspicion about communism and Confucianism? Because this shit shows up in Orange County and San Jose. <laughs> this stuff shows up in weird ways. I'm like, wait, are you guys Americans? Are you guys communists? Because you guys are doing the same thing. You're like limiting com conversation. You're 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 putting your control down on what we can say and what we can't say. You're doing the same thing that they're doing and you're claiming that it's cultural, that we have to follow these cultural rules. You know, that's a very controversial thing for me to say. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a lot of people who are Americans who are like, you know, Democrats or not Democrats, de democratic in their way of thinking. And they really push this idea of like, hey, there is no barrier to like this hierarchy. So, so, so I'm like, Telling the, the the older people that I deal with in, in 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 America, I'm like, guys, like you guys are thinking the same way as the communists. It's no different. So let's explore and examine why we have so much issue with communists. It's because it's cloaked in it's it's all the same. We can't as American second generation Vietnamese, we can't deal with this anymore. We can't deal with that control. We're like, wait a minute. We got to break down this hierarchy and we have to be able to really speak our minds, especially the work that both of you do, intellectuals, academics. We have to think about different frameworks that break and shatter these ceilings of um, hierarchy. So I'm very happy that we are, are here and talking mm -hmm. about this. True. Can I just briefly say, uh, my dad sent me an email not too long ago and he was saying, the older generation, his older brothers, they they just, I wish I had the email with me, but basically it's like, they're, they're stuck in their ways, basically. It's really yep. a generational thing. And so I think it's very much Confucian, you know, the filial piety and, but, um, but yeah, I, what are your thoughts on this yet? Well, I, I was interested in maybe bringing this back to the question about whether or not Vietnam is ready for a place or an institution like Fulbright to exist. Um, because 
you have these youth who are so well trained in terms of like how to think critically and they come out and they want to go grad school abroad and i'm hoping that's really also for them to be trained even further but i wonder after they go abroad will they come back to vietnam or will they look to stay abroad like will they have what they need to sustain them in vietnam in terms of having a place that allows them to think critically and push against boundaries and um ask questions that that make sure things are working well you know because if it's if it's going to be where they have they're equipped with all of this critical thinking and then the society doesn't allow them to or like just traps them whenever they finish their asking questions and then i have a i have a guess, what's your guess? how this is going to play out <laughs> yeah I have, a, I have a guess. In 1997, I got to USC and I met a young student. And my brother and I were both a little older. We did military service. We uh, saw this kid and he was this bright kid. And we found out that he uh, was from Barria and he had finished high school in Riverside, California. Mm-hmm. Got to USC, really smart. And then we start to find out that his father was like a local, uh, like bigwig in in the government mm-hmm. in Barria. And then so the word got around and everybody's like, stay away from that kid. You know, he's communist, blah, blah, blah. So that was like late 90s. And then, you know, he eventually became my roommate. My, my brother and I, we we, we, we stayed in uh, an apartment in Koreatown together. We, we loved him. And his name's Paul. And he got a master's at USC, undergrad at USC, and you know, uh, stayed in the US for a number of years. And then he went back to Vietnam. And then he started to run uh, IDG, Venture Capital Fund, and he became, you know, he rose very quickly. Mm-hmm. And he began to work with American Viet Kios from, from the United States, like big guys like Henry Wynn and work, you know, uh, he's been on the podcast. So none of this is like new information. And so, Vol is his name and the pattern of fall in the early days was like okay i think when they first get here they're like oh my god they're enamored by this idea of like you know openness and and free speech and and they live this uh for a good decade or 20 years and then they go back and then they're like okay well now we have to operate and bring the new Mm -hmm. stuff back to vietnam then it's like so when you leave it's like 20 steps forward in those 20 years and then it's like 10 15 years backwards so they have to now deal with the backwardness of 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 that society, which is Vietnam's um, current, whatever, wherever they are in the history of Vietnam. So there's now there's like stratas of these Vietnamese students that are going to the United States coming back after 15, 20 years. And they're bringing back a lot of knowledge and they know that they have to like deal with the regression of kind of like blending back in. But eventually a lot of them are going to be in power and that's the guess of like my VidQ friends who've been in Vietnam for 30 years. I mean, Ivy League guys who are in Vietnam today, after 30 years, they're like, given another 20, 25 years, you'll see all of that, the full, the full fam of the world returning. And yeah, they they have that regression. They have that like 15, 20 years, like you have to go back a little bit and deal with like all the 60, 70 year old party leaders but they eventually will be the party leaders in 25 years because they have done their 20 years in, uh, abroad, brought back these systems, and then they're going to incorporate it and try to figure out how this is all going to work. Mm-hmm. Now, will we get a prime minister like uh, the Singapore, um, I forget his name. I mean, I should know his name here. Yeah. He changed, you know, Singapore. Will we get one person like that that can really clean it up and, and make it, I don't know, but I pretty sure that you're going to have an army of like educated uh, people that came from outside of Vietnam coming back to change Vietnam slowly. And that's my guess. How do you react to that? I'm curious. Well, I, I'm, I'm also thinking about that question again. It's like, in that case, you're almost saying is, I feel like your response to that question is no, Vietnam is not ready for a place like Fulbright yet, but that but it seems like there always needs to be that gap. You Fulbright because it's kind of um, on your terms, like um, ahead in, in terms of training the students in a certain way. 
then a lot of them will want to go abroad. And that forward thinking is what needs to exist in Vietnam to pull it also forward. That's, that's kind of me rehashing what you said, Ken. Um, I mean, yeah, but it, I think it's happening. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's there's a slow change, you know, and it they're they are changing. And you know, RMIT is not is not a, a place that you can discount as well because yeah. they all speak English. Yeah. And a lot of RMIT students, I don't know Fulbright as well as our, my brother's been over at RMITs for like 18 years, and and so I've been on campus many times, and they all speak perfect English. And you're like, wait are you born in the United States and just have come here recently to mm-hmm. live in Vietnam? My brother's like, no, th- those kids were have never, some of them never left Vietnam. So you could see that they're consuming YouTube videos, podcasts that are from the West and from outside of Vietnam. Mm-hmm. I think when I ask like, is, is society ready? It's because there is this huge gap I'm finding between the youth who clearly have different um, directions and motivations than like this older generation that makes it that kind of create these obstacles like you guys are not patriotic or things like that but um, if I mean ultimately the country will be run by the youth right so if we kind of just put faith into the youth which is what Fulbright's mission is then hopefully that'll that'll be okay in the future but when something like a disinformation campaign happens on an institution that is like pretty prestigious in Vietnam, it's it's it makes you kind of question like, is society ready for this kind of place? I, th- I think that society anywhere in the world is never ready for mm-hmm. change, and it does require um, these huge ships that break the ice. You know, you have those ice breaking ships that 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 are you know that need to go in and do it and if not Fulbright then who mm. um, it's not going to be RMIT I think RMIT's spe- specialty is mm-hmm. different than uh, Fulbright um, Fulbright leans a little bit more into the liberal arts and I think RMIT is a technical mm-hmm. um, institution that leans heavily on business and and probably other uh, other subjects uh, beyond um, the liberal arts I want to ask you both, um, what does it mean to be Vietnamese to you today? We knew you were going to ask this. This is the one thing we prepared. (laughs) I have an answer. I can go first. So to me, being Vietnamese means being creative by freely borrowing from other cultures. And here's why, why I mean that. I mean, the name Vietnam, the name arguably comes from Yuenan, which is a Chinese term, which literally means those people over there to the south of us. And it's a Chinese-centric term. And so uh, it was called Indochina because the, the Indian influence and the Chinese influence, so we get our Buddhism from India, our Confucianism from China, our ideas of politics from the West and from France. And so, you know, even pho, it might come from the pot au feu. It might be a French thing. Who knows? Ban mi, obviously. Ao yai, uh, Parisian influence, uh, Chinese dress, but with Parisian influence. So basically, and even the, the famous tale of Gu, right, by Nguyen Zhu, that is a Chinese novel, but then done. You know, so being Vietnamese is basically taking things and then just making it better. So I'm very proud <laughs> proud of that. That's my answer. Um, because I live in Vietnam now, I have this, these everyday occurrences that are always in tension with one another of how things should work and how things actually work. Um, and sometimes the way that things work, like actually is great in terms of like more convenience. But sometimes that unofficial way is super inconvenient or like, you know, it also lends its way to corruption. Um, but currently, I think if you ask me what this, if you ask me this question, you know, 10 years from now, I will have a different answer. But currently, it's this expression of convenience over control. And because I live in Vietnam, convenience wins. So 
I'm thinking about a bus. You know, when you go on a bus, for example, and there are 10 seats on the bus, but there are 15 people who want to go to Mengdao. What does the bus driver do? All right, everybody, 15 people, get skid in. Just everybody just jam in. It'll be a quick ride. We'll, yeah. we'll get there. And everybody is happy because everybody gets to go where they want to go. The bus driver gets a little bit of extra money for that trip. And it's great. Like that, that is <laughs> the modus operandi right now, even though that's not like the official way that things are supposed to work. So the convenience over control thing is, is waiting out. Yeah. <laughs> you, your answer is probably the, I've never heard that ever in the years <laughs> that I've asked this question, but that's a, a cool response. And Kevin, you put it eloquently what so many others have said about um, this, uh, the way you, you framed it. But I do want to ask another question. Um, and I don't want to, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I'm going to do it. Um, who are some I'll give you some some um, some time to think about this. Who are some of your modern day Vietnamese heroes, whether they're in Vietnam, whether they're in uh, the diaspora or whether they're in academics or film or wherever. But can you tell me uh, some names of people that you you um, modern day? It could be in the last hundred years um, that you really follow and that you really uh, alive or or did that to be could alive be alive or dead? Or dead you know, but oh. modern times, you know, um, maybe last fifty years <laughs> that you really follow and that. I was yeah. like, are you are you getting inspiration <laughs> based on our heroes? Are you going to go look them up and ask them to be on your podcast? <laughs> Yes, I will. The modern ones, the ones that are still alive, I'm going to reach out to them. <laughs> yeah, they must have an Instagram account too, oh, so yeah. I can you know reach out to them. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Like I, I want to know um, who you both think are people that um, that really influence the culture and that are moving the needle or have moved the needle and laid some foundation to um, the modern Vietnamese, uh, who we are becoming and where we're going. Now, now, when you say we, is that Vietnamese Americans or is it just Vietnamese Americans and Vietnamese? I think both, Vietnamese Americans and Vietnam uh, from the homeland. Uh, who's moving the needle? Um, and, and and if you have to break it down, you know, then I'd love to hear that. Like, is it Ocean Vuong? Is it Viet Thanh Nguyen for the Vietnamese diaspora? Um, who is doing that in Vietnam, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, my, my kind of, I guess, simple answer. I mean, obviously to me, well, it's Viet Thanh Nguyen who first jumps to mind in the sense that he's really... Is he a hero? Um, first off, there have always... No, no, hold on. Wait, wait. <laughs> okay. Whoa. <laughs> Tell me how you really feel. Jeez. Let, let me Damn. Finish. She just unleashed the fury. That's your hero? Here's what I'm saying. Well, you know, guys, this way, is unedited. Like, we don't edit, like, here at the Vietnamese podcast. Well, people yeah. know already first know off, first off, in you. some All right. In some ways, he is very admirable. And in some sense, he is sort of a hero. Yes. Mm. What I'm saying is that he, um, there have always been Vietnamese American writers, um, Andrew Lam, you know, Andrew Pham, and many, um, but Viet Thanh Nguyen just made it blow up, you know, and, and what's, what I like about Viet Thanh Nguyen, I mean, I mean, he's a progressive and, and he's outspoken. My dad loves him. My dad and I are our fans. So, so he's, he's kind of, in a sense, paving that way, at least in, in the United States. I mean, I don't think anyone can deny that. I mean, he's he's huge. So, yeah. Okay. Mm. Um, <laughs> I didn't mean to, like, say it like that, I guess. <laughs> I was just surprised. I didn't know that was your hero. But I think I think that, that answer no. here answers the question about moving the needle. I mean, I have other answers if you were to let me like go into the 20th century, but I, I meant like today, you know. So. We're going to do that on the podcast I have with you. And then, you know, I'm going to ask you the same question on the podcast I have with you later. <laughs> um, I think it's it's kind of hard for me because you've just sprung this question. I'm like, 
Um, but no, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Yeah, but a number of people do come up to to mind, and like I did think of Ocean Vuong because I do think he has a way with words. I I I don't want to say call him a, my a hero, and I don't know if that's a role that he wants to fulfill for somebody who he doesn't know either. Um, but I do think his words have have the saving power. <laughs> um, and then the other person I thought of pretty recently and who just passed away very tragically was is um, Lin Kule. Lin Kule was an art was an art curator and an art artist, uh, contemporary artist, and he really changed the cultural space of Vietnam. And for the, he was the he co-founded the first public art space uh, called Sun Art in Ho Chi Minh City. And um, that was really where a lot of artists could exhibit their work. There was really no other place that was public um, or, to, or for the public. So I think that's really important. And some of the arts that he's done on Agent Orange um, have been very provocative. Like when I think about it, I get the chills. But I think he's someone that will be missed dearly and has really changed um, the, like, just culturally that space for Vietnam. So, and, and that, that cafe still exists in Hanoi, right? Uh, which one? The artist space. No, this is the, the San Saigon, Art that's, right? that still exists here. Yes, exists here. It's in Ho Chi Minh City. Okay, mm-hmm. sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Now, since you guys are podcasters, uh, do you guys have any questions for me before we go? (laughs) Yes, we do. There's so many. What's a what's a recent surprising uh, answer or perspective that you get? Um, Well, actually, no, no, I no, yeah, no, I won't go there, but. That that's a general one. What 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 is what is something that somebody said that kind of took you, made you surprised? You know, this answer is going to surprise you, but I have a very bad memory. I do. I, I have a really horrible memory, and um, unless I'm given some time to think about, that's why I'm very uh, sensitive to putting people on the spot. Because if like what you're doing right now to me, I'm like, uh, I'm like a doing headlights. <laughs> And I have learned to be honest with that and and respond like honestly, like, you know, if I had to really think about it, I'd have to go through and watch everything and then really think about like in the last, last year. I, I, I have an easier question. Yes. How do you choose, how do you choose who to interview? What's that process? Yeah. I um, am very open about this. Um, for me, uh, there's sort of like the two first, uh, the two basic criteria is uh, the past and the future. So the past needs to have serious work. Like I, I got to see like these guys or whoever it is that I bring on has got to have like a real history of doing the work, the heavy lifting, right? That's like number number one requirement. The number two requirement is how much into the future, what's their trajectory into the work that they're going to be doing? I don't want somebody who is like what this offer? person who's like this... Uh, one offer. Yeah. I, I, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't like that. I like somebody who you have a feeling that they're going to just like never stop, you know, cause I respect those two things. Like what's your past work? How much heavy lifting have you done? And then like, do I get the feeling like you are going to take this to the day you die? Cause that's how I live my life. Right. I, <laughs> I, I, I want to make sure. Yeah. Like I did the heavy lifting and I want to like, I want to mess with people and hang out with people that, I know are going to be continuing to do probably even more heavy lifting. So those are my two criteria. But, but but like, how do you find them? Like, do you Google Vietnamese people? People uh, send me uh, links like all day long now. And then like, just by Nate, by just by being around uh, this so much living in the heart of it. uh, Yeah. It's, it's a nonstop like train for me now. It's just constantly. And, you know, I can sniff out like who's, uh, who's like the fly by night one, you know, one offs. So I, I, I'm always open to watch and to see where the work develops into. Mm -hmm. Um, 
But that all being said, there's also this idea of like new filmmakers, right? Young directors, you know, who don't have the heavy lifting years of it. But do they come with this certain oomph of their work? You know, um, they're, have they been thinking about this in a, in a critical way? So that's the, the, the criteria that, I, that really, really does it for me. And, you know, I've been off. I think maybe, you know, it, you can't have a perfect record in doing this. Um, we're going to be, we're going to have it off sometime. And, you know, I've had people quit and I'm like, oh my God, I failed myself. <laughs> right. But, um, for the most part, that's how I, that's how I pick, uh, that's how I pick the guests. So don't have to be famous. I don't care about social media numbers. None of that matters to me. What matters is the seriousness of the work and how they approach it. So you guys are like overqualified <laughs> for this, uh, I appreciate though, like I appreciate that rationale, the past and the future, like, you know, have something to show for yourself, but also demonstrate a certain level of commitment. And that's definitely what committed or definitely what we are. We're not half assering you kind of yep. people, nope. <laughs> as you can tell. And you know, but that reminds me of when we were excited to come on the podcast. I remember telling Kevin, I was like, it's a, it's a, career milestone that means that we're we're legitimate people <laughs> we've been oh, recognized that's crazy as, to hear that I'm... as i don't know committed enough now in kenya's eyes oh i think i said we are officially Vietnamese. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know with that being said I, I i do um I do hope that we develop uh, a friendship and a relationship uh, going into the next 30 years of our lives together here on earth um, in this space because, um, and I, and I mean that when I say like, you know, I have friends um, that uh, 40 years, you know, I've close friends that are 40 years, uh, close friends that have been um, in my life for 30 years. I value friendship and, and the depth of, of, of human connection very, very much. And within the, you know, um, uh, uh, film space, you know, 25, 30 years, many, many friends in that space that are, are in the podcast. And so in the podcast world that you are in like inhabiting with me and I'm inhabiting with you, I pray that we can exist together and be friends and you can reach out and say, hey, can you introduce me to that uh, uh, guest? And if I can, I will. Uh, but there's, you know, like Ocean Vuong, I cannot because I don't have that. I don't have a close relationship with them. I just have to go through an agent who reaches out to me when they have a book. And so I don't have that friendship with certain people. But if I do have that friendship, I would definitely um, uh, uh, pass it along. Uh, in a, That's one thing I can be very generous about. Um, so you know, just I, I just, I just want to say exactly the same. And, and I really appreciate you reaching out and letting this connection happen. I think it's really important that these conversations happen. And so thank you for offering this space, your podcast for listeners to, you know, engage. And like today, let, let me just say like, okay, right now, so I'm a professor right now, I'm teaching a course on free speech. And one of the things uh, that we were doing today was this theory of free speech that emphasizes thinkers. Basically, the argument is in order for us to be thinkers, for us to develop our own beliefs and ideas, we need other people. So I made my students do an activity. It was fascinating. I just tried it for the first time today, like right before this podcast. I, I had them all silently think to themselves, no looking at phones, no writing, no nothing, just sitting and thinking for three minutes about a belief they have about themselves or the world or whatever, any belief. And then share that with a stranger, another student, where the stranger listens and asks questions. And almost all of them were like, when I was by myself, I just couldn't think. Like, I couldn't come up with reasons for my belief. I just kept repeating the same sentence. I hit a wall. But the moment I have another person in front of me yeah. as a sounding board, I could actually develop the ideas. I could justify the ideas. So the point I'm trying to make is that when listeners listen to a podcast, yeah, they're not able to speak and then be responded to, but they're still hearing the dialogue that's doing some thinking, you know, that they can think along with. Yeah. So that's that. It's basically developing thinkers for the Vietnamese community. That's very cool. Yeah, and and I want to let you both know that I am not 
as busy as you think I am. You can always reach out and say, hey, let's schedule a podcast. We want to talk about this subject. And I'm down. I'm, I'm, my door is always open for all my friends and previous guests to do that and reach out and say, hey, we got this idea. We'd like to come on and, and talk about it. So I'm publicly letting you guys know that the door is always open. I respect the work that you both do. And I hope that we have a fruitful um I ho hope we have a fruitful uh, time on earth uh, for the next few decades together. Thank you, nice. Kenneth. It was it's Thank you such both. a pleasure to talk to you and get to know you and be on your podcast. Thank you. Very much agree. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Vietnamese with Kenneth Nguyen. Special thanks to Brittany Tran, to Jane Nguyen, Catherine Nguyen, Tina Pham, Sydney Jamie, and Christo Trin. Please find us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at the Vietnamese podcast.